Welcome to Storylink Radio. Storylink Radio podcasts provide 24-7 storytelling from professional storytellers along with the text for every story so listeners can read along with the storyteller, including tonight's presentation. This provides a fun experience, a deeper understanding of the story, and promotes literacy, especially for language learners. This is always provided free of charge. Please visit www.storylinkradio.com. We're drawing tonight on the amazing editing work of Mr. Glenn Hughes of Derbyshire, England. As Mr. Hughes points out, there's a, there's a certain set of books which you're just supposed to know about, at least if you live in the West and want people to call you educated. Many of these books look far too old or long or boring. But still, the polite world expects its members to be at least on nodding terms with Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Darcy, Starbuck, Mr. Toad, Mr. Scrooge, Leopold Bloom, Raskolnikov, Einstein, and Enkidu. Uh, and besides, it's a lot of fun to be able to explore these timeless works in a, a quick and exciting way. And once you get a taste of a particular book, you may be spared ever picking it up again. Or you may just want to dive in and read the original book cover to cover. Tonight's selection is the <clears throat> squashed version of The Last Days of Pompeii. Squashed down from a 14-hour long story to eh, about 30 minutes. <laughs> Exciting, huh? We are presenting live tonight from Storylink Radio's Pompeii recreation in the virtual world of Kitely. Visit www.storylinkradio.com to find out how to join us for future story presentations. Here we go. The Last Days of Pompeii. The Last Days of Pompeii is a novel written by Edward Bulyer Lytton in 1834 and was inspired by the painting The Last Day of Pompeii by the Russian painter Karl Bryalov. Edward Bullier Lytton is famous for such iconic lines as It was a dark and stormy night, and The pen is mightier than the sword. The Last Days of Pompeii tells the story of the virtuous Greeks Glaucus and Ion, and their escape from Pompeii amid the eruption of Vesuvius in 79 AD. Quick intro to this complex tale, then right on to the story. Pompeii, AD 79. Athenian nobleman Glaucus arrives in a bustling and gaudy Roman town and quickly falls in love with the beautiful Greek woman, Ione. Ione's guardian, the malevolent Egyptian sorcerer Arbaces, has his own designs on Ione and sets out to destroy her and Glaucus's budding happiness. Arbaces has already ruined Ione's brother Apecides by luring him to join the vice-ridden priesthood of Isis. The blind slave girl Nydia is rescued from her abusive owners by Glaucus, for whom she secretly pines. Arbaces horrifies Ione by declaring his love for her and flying into rage when she refuses him. Glaucus and Ione exult in their love, much to Nydia's torment. Julia, a rich young woman who has eyes for Glaucus, is aided by Nydia to obtain a love potion from the sorcerer Arbaces to win Glaucus's love. But the love potion is really a poison that will turn Glaucus mad. Nydia steals the potion and administers it to make Glaucus fall in love with her instead. Glaucus drinks only a small amount and begins raving wildly. When Arbaces learns that Apecides is going to publicly reveal the deception of the cult of Isis, Arbaces stabs Apecides to death and pins the crime on Glaucus. Glaucus' sentence is to be fed to wild cats in the amphitheater. Before the lions can dine, however, ash and stone begin to rain down from the sky, causing mass panic. Glaucus escapes the amphitheater and rescues Ione from the house of Arbaces. Despite her unrequited love for Glaucus, Nydia leads Glaucus and Ione through the dark streets filled with smoke from the volcano to safety on a ship in the Bay of Naples. So that was the uh, brief introduction to a complex story. And if you'd like to read along with your storyteller, the text for tonight's story can be found at www.storylinkradio.com and click on the Podcasts button. The Last Days of Pompeii, Chapter 1, The Athenians' Love Story 
Within the narrow compass of the walls of Pompeii was contained a specimen of every gift which luxury offered to power. In its minute but glittering shops, its tiny palaces, its baths, its forum, its theater, its circus, and the energy, yet corruption, and the refinement, yet the vice of its people, you beheld a model of the whole Roman Empire. It was a toy, a plaything, a showbox in which the gods seemed pleased to keep the representation of the great monarchy of Earth, and which they afterwards hid from time to give to the wonders of posterity the moral of the maxim that under the sun there is nothing new. Crowded in the glassy bay were vessels of commerce and gilded galleys for the pleasures of the rich citizens. The boats of the fishermen glided to and fro, and afar off you saw the tall mass of the fleet under the command of Pliny. Drawing a comrade from the crowded streets, Glaucus the Greek, newly returned to Pompeii after a journey to Naples, bent his steps towards a solitary part of the beach, and the two, seated on a small crag which rose amidst the smooth pebbles, inhaled the voluptuous and cooling breeze which, dancing over the waters, kept music with its invisible feet. There was something in this scene which invited them to silence and reverie. Clodius, the Adile, that's like um, a mayor. Claudius the Adile, who sought the wherewithal for his pleasures at the gaming table, shaded his eyes from the burning sky and calculated the gains of the past week. He was one of the many who found it easy to enrich themselves at the expense of his companions. The Greek, learning upon, leaning upon his hand and shrinking not from that sun, his nation's tutelary deity, with whose fluent light of poesy and joy and love his own veins were filled, gazed upon the broad expanse and envied perhaps every wind that bent its pinions toward the shores of Greece. Glaucus obeyed no more vicious dictates than when he wandered into the dissipations of his time that the exhilarating voices of youth and health. His heart never was corrupted, of far more penetration than Clodius and his other gay companions deemed. He, he saw the design to prey upon his riches and his youth, but he despised wealth save as the means of enjoyment, and youth was the great sympathy that united him to them. To him the world was one vast prison to which the sovereign of Rome was the imperial jailer, and the very virtues which in the free days of Athens would have made him ambitious, and the slavery of earth made him inactive and supine. Tell me, Clodius, said the Athenian at last, hast thou ever been in love? Yes, <laughs> in love very often. Uh, he who has loved often, answered Glaucus, has loved never. Or art thou then soberly and earnestly in love, my friend? Hast thou that feeling which the poets describe, a, a feeling which makes us neglect our suppers, forswear the theatre, write elegies? <laughs> I should never have thought it of you. You dissemble well. But I'm not that far gone enough for that, returned Glaucus, smiling. In fact, I, I am not in love, but I could be if there but to be occasion to see the object. <laughs> the object. Shall I guess the object, then? Is it not Diomed's daughter? She adores you, Glaucus, and does not affect to conceal it. She is both handsome and rich. She will bind the doorpost of her husband with golden fillets. No, I do not desire to sell myself, my friend. Diomed's daughter is handsome, I grant, and at one time, had she not been the grandchild of a freedman, I might have, yet no, she carries all her beauty in her face. Her manners are not maidenlike, and her mind knows no culture save that of pleasure. You are ungrateful, my friend. Tell me, then, who is the fortunate virgin? Uh, yes, you shall hear him, my Claudius. Several months ago I was sojourning at Naples, a city utterly to my own heart. One day I entered the temple of Minerva to offer up my prayers, not for myself, more than for the city in which Pallas smiles no longer. The temple was empty and deserted. The recollections of Athens crowded fast and meltingly upon me. Imagining myself still alone, my, my prayer gushed from my heart to my lips, and I wept as I prayed. I was startled in the midst of my devotions, however, by a deep sigh. I turned suddenly, and just behind me was a female. She had raised her veil also in prayer, and when her eyes met me, thought a celestial ray shot from those dark and smiling orbs at once into my soul. Never, my Claudius, my friend, never have I seen mortal face more exquisitely moulded, 
A sort of melancholy softened and yet elevated its expression. Tears were rolling down her eyes. I guessed at once that she was of the Athenian lineage, of course. I, I, I spoke to her, though with a faltering voice. Art thou not too Athenian? said I. At the sound of my voice she blushed and half drew her veil back across her face. My forefather's ashes, she said, repose by the water of Elysius. My birth is of Naples, but my heart has my lineage is Athenian. Well, let us then, said I, make our offerings together. And as the priest now appeared, we stood side by side, and so followed the ceremonial prayer. Together we touched the knees of the goddess, together we laid our olive garlands on the altar. Silently we left the temple, and I was about to ask her where she dwelt when a, a youth a youth whose features resembled hers, took her by the hand. She turned and bade me farewell. The crowd parted us, and I, I saw her no more. More when I returned to Naples after a brief absence at Athens, was I able to discover any clue to my lost countrywoman. So hoping to lose in gaiety all remembrance of that beautiful apparition, I, I hastened to plunge myself amidst the luxuries of Pompeii. This is all my history. I... I do not love, but I remember, I remember and I regret. So said Glaucus. But that very night, in a house at Pompeii, whither she had come from Naples during his absence, Glaucus came face to face once more with the beautiful Ione, the object of his dreams. And no longer was he able to say, I do not love. Chapter 2 of Bacchus, the Egyptian Sorcerer Now amongst the wealthy dwellers in Pompeii, was one who lived apart and was at once an object of suspicion and fear. The riches of this man, who was known as Arbaces the Egyptian, enabled him to gratify to the utmost the passions which governed him, the passion of, of a central indulgence and of the blind force which impelled him to seek relief from physical sadie in the, in the pursuit of that occult knowledge which he regarded as the heritage of his own race. In Naples, Abaches had known the parents of Ione and her brother Apecides, and it was under his guardianship that they had come to Pompeii. The confidence which, before their death, their parents had reposed in this Egyptian was in turn fully given to him by Ione and her brother. For Apecides, the Egyptian, felt nothing but contempt. The youth was to him but an instrument that, that might be used by him in bending Ione to his will. But the mind of Ione no less than the beauty of her form, appealed to Arbaces. With her by his side, his willing slave, he saw no limit to the heights his ambition might soar to. He sought primarily to impress her with his store of unfamiliar knowledge. She, in turn, admired Arbaces for his learning and felt grateful to him for his guardianship. Apecides, docile and mild, with a soul peculiarly alive to religious fervor, Arbaces placed amongst the priests of Isis and under the special care of a creature of his own named Calenius. It pleased his purpose best, where Ion was concerned, to leave her a while surrounded by the vain youth of Pompeii, so that he might gain by comparison. It fell, though not within Herbace's plans, to show himself too often to his ward. Consequently, it was some time before he became aware of the warmth of the friendship that was growing up between Ion and the handsome Greek. He knew not of their evening excursions on the placid sea, of their nightly meetings at Ion's dwelling, till these had become regular happenings in their li daily lives. But one day he surprised them together, and his eyes were suddenly opened. No sooner had the Greek departed than the Egyptian sought to poison Ion's mind against him by exaggerating his love of pleasure and by unscrupulously describing him as making light of Ion's love. Following up the advantage he gained by this appeal to her pride, Arbaces reminded Ione that she had never seen the interior of his home. It might, he said, amuse her. Devote, then, he went on, to the austere friend of your youth one of these bright summer evenings, and let me boast that my gloomy mansion has been honored with the presence of the admired Ione. Unconscious of the pollutions of the mansion, of the danger that awaited her, Ione readily assented to the proposal. But there was one who, by accident, had become aware of the nature of the spells cast by Arbaces upon his visitors, and who was to be the humble means of saving Ione from his toils. This was the blind flower girl, Nidia. 
A Thessalian extraction and gentle nurture. Nydia had been stolen and sold into the slavery of an ex-gladiator named Burbo, a relative of the false priest Calenius. To save her from the cruelty of Burbo, Glaucus had purchased her, and in return the blind girl had become devoted to him, so devoted that her gentle heart was torn when he made it plain to her that his action was prompted by mere natural kindness of heart, and that it was his purpose to send her to Ion. But Nydia cast all feeling of jealousy aside when she heard of Ion's visit to the Egyptian, and quickly apprised Glaucus and the Pecades of the fair Athenian's peril. On her arrival, Abaches greeted Ion with deep respect, but he found it harder than he thought to resist the charm of her presence in his house. In a moment of, of a forgetful passion, Abaches declared his love for Ion. Abaches, he declared, shall have no ambition save the pride of obeying thee, Ion. Ion, do not reject my love. And as he spoke, he knelt before her. Alone, and in the grip of this singular and powerful man, Ion was not yet terrified. The respect of his language, the softness of his voice, reassured her, and in her own purity she felt protection, but she was confused, she was astonished. It was, it was some moments before she could recover the power of reply. Rise, Abaches, said she at length. Rise, and if thou art serious, if, if thy language be in earnest to me. If, he said tenderly. Well, then, listen. You have been my my guardian, my, my friend, my, my monitor, my parent. For this new character I was not prepared. Think not, she added quickly, as, he, as she saw his dark eyes glitter with the fierceness of his passion. Think not, Arbaches, that I scorn. Think not that I am untouched, that I am not honoured by this homage, but, but say, canst thou hear me calmly? I, though the words were lightning and could blast me. Very well, Arbaches, hear me. I love another, said Ion blushingly, but in a firm voice. By the gods, shouted Arbaches, rising to his fullest height, dare not tell me that. Dare not mock me. It is impossible. Whom hast thou seen? Whom known? Oh, I own it is thy woman's invention, thy woman's art that speaks. Thou wouldst gain time. I have surprised, I, I have terrified thee. Alas, began I own, and then appalled before his sudden and unlooked, unlooked for violence, she burst into tears. Abaches came nearer to her. His breath glowed fiercely on her cheek. He wound his arms round her. She sprang from his embrace. In the struggle, a tablet fell from her bosom. Arbaches perceived and seized it. It was a letter she had received that morning from Glaucus. Ion sank upon the couch, half dead with terror. Rapidly the eyes of Arbaches ran over the writing. He heard it, and he read it to the end. And then, as the letter fell from his hand, he said in a voice of deceitful calmness, Is this the right of this man thou lovest? Ion sobbed but answered not. Speak to me. It is, it is he whom I love. Then hear me, said Abache, sinking his voice into a whisper. Thou shalt go to thy tomb rather than to his arms. At that instant a curtain was rudely torn aside, and Glaucus and Episcades came in. There was a severe struggle which might have had a more sinister ending had not the marble head of a goddess shaken from its column, fallen upon Arbaches as he was about to stab the Greek and struck the Egyptian senseless to the ground. As it was, Ione was saved, and she and her lover were then and forever reconciled to one another. Chapter 3. The Love Filter. That's filter with a P-H, not a F, which is, you know, like a love potion. Clodius had not spoken without warrant when he had said that Julia, the daughter of the rich merchant Diomed, thought herself in love with Glaucus. But since Glaucus was denied to her, her thoughts were concentrated on revenge. In this mood she sought out Arbaches, presenting herself as one loving unrequitedly and seeking in sorrow the aid of wisdom. It is a love charm, admitted Julia, that I would seek from thy skills, O wise Egyptian sorcerer. A love charm, yes. I know not if I love him who loves me not, but I, I know that I would see myself triumph over my rival, you see? 
I would see him who has rejected me, my suitor. I would see her whom he has preferred in her turn. Despised. Yes, a love charm I need. Very quickly, Abache discerned Julia's secret, and when he heard that Glaucus and Ion were shortly to be wedded, he gladly availed himself of this opportunity to rid himself of his hated rival, Glaucus. But he dealt not in love potions, he said. He would, however, take Diomed's daughter, Julia, to one who did, the witch who dwelt on the slopes of Vesuvius. There's always a witch on the slopes of Vesuvius, he kept his promise. But the entire filter given to Julia was one which went direct to the brain, and the effects of which, for neither Arbacus nor his creature, the witch, wished to place themselves within the power of law, were such as caused those who witnessed them to attribute them to some supernatural agency. But once again, though less happily than on the former occasion, Nydia was destined to be the means of thwarting the schemes of this Egyptian. The devotion of the blind flower girl had deepened into love for her deliverer. She was jealous of Ion. Now, for Julia had taken her into her confidence and both believed in the love charm, she was confronted with another rival. And so, by a simple ruse, Nydia obtained the poison draught and in its place substituted a phial of simple water. At the close of a banquet given to Diomed, to which the Greek was invited, Julia duly administered that which she imagined to be the secret love potion. She was disappointed when she found Glaucus coldly replaced the cup and conversed with her in the same unmoved tone as before. Ah, perhaps tomorrow, yes, tomorrow, she thought Julia. Tomorrow, alas, for Glaucus. Yes, alas, for Glaucus, indeed. When Glaucus arrived at his own house that evening, Nydia was waiting for him. She had, as usual, been tending the flowers and had lingered a while to rest herself. It has been warm, said Glaucus. Wilt thou summon Davis? The wine I have drunk heats me, and I long for some cooling drink. Here at once, suddenly and unexpectedly, the very opportunity that Nydia waited presented itself. She breathed quickly. I will prepare for you myself, said she, the summer draught that I own loves of honey and weak wine cooled in snow. Oh, thank you, said the unconscious Glaucus. If I own loves it enough to be grateful... <laughs> were it poison. Nydia frowned at this, and then smiled. She withdrew for a few moments, and returned the cup containing the beverage, and Glaucus took it from her hand. Now what would not Nydia have given, then, to have seen the first dawn of the imagined love? Far different as she stood then and there, with the thoughts and emotions of the blind girl from those of the vain Pompeian under a similar suspense. Glaucus had raised the cup to his lips, he had already drained about a fourth of its contents, when suddenly glancing upon the face of Nydia, he was so forcibly struck by its alteration, by its, in, its intense and painful and strange expression, that he paused abruptly, and still holding the cup near his lips, exclaimed, Why, Nydia, Nydia, art thou, in, art thou ill or in pain? What ails thee, my poor child? And as Glaucus spoke, he put down the cup, <laughs> happily for him unfinished, and rose from his seat to approach Nydia when a sudden pang shot coldly to his heart and was followed by a wild, confused, dizzy sensation at the brain. The floor seemed to glide from under him. His feet seemed to move on air. A mighty and unearthly gladness rushed upon his spirit. He felt too buoyant for this earth. He longed for wings. Nay, it seemed as if he already possessed them. He burst involuntarily into a loud and thrilling laugh. He clapped his hands. He bounced aloft. Suddenly this perpetual transport passed, though only partially away. He now felt his blood rushing loudly and rapidly through his veins, and then a kind of darkness fell over Glaucus' eyes. Now a torrent of broken, incoherent, insane words gushed from his lips, and to Nydia's horror he passed the portico with a bound and rushed down the starlit street, striking fear into the hearts of all who saw him. Chapter 4 and the Last, The Day of the Ghastly Night Anxious to learn if the drug had taken effect, Arbace set out for Julia's house on the morrow. On his way he encountered Epicides. Hot words passed between them, and stung by the scorn of the youth, he stabbed him into the heart with his stylus. At this moment Glaucus came along. Quick as thought, the Egyptian sorcerer struck the already half-senseless Greek to the ground, and steeping his stylus in the blood of Epicides and recovering his own, called loudly for help. The next moment he was accusing Glaucus of the crime. But time 
fortune favored the Egyptian. Glaucus, whose strong frame still under the influence of the poison potion, was sentenced to encounter a lion in the amphitheater, with no weapon beyond the incriminating stylus. Nydia, in her terror, confessed to the Egyptian the exchange of the love filter. She who imprisoned in his house, Calinius, who had witnessed the deed, sought her body with the intention of using his knowledge to his own profit. He, by a stratagem, was incarcerated in one of the dungeons of the Egyptian's dwelling. The law gave Ione into the guardianship of Abaches, and yet, for a third time, Nydia was the means of frustrating the plans of Abaches. The blind flower girl, when vainly endeavoring to escape from the toils of the Egyptian, overheard in his garden the conversation of Abaches and Calenius, and she heard the cries of Calenius from behind the door of the chamber in which he was imprisoned. She herself was caught again by Abaches' servant, but she contrived to bribe her keeper to take a message to Glaucus' friend, Sallust, and he, taking his servants to Abache's house, released the two captives and reached the arena with them to accuse Abache's before the multitude at the very moment when the lion was being goaded to attack the Greek and Abache's victory seemed within his grasp. Even now the nerve of the Egyptian did not desert him. He met the charge with his accustomed coolness, but the frenzied accusation of the priest of Isis turned the huge assembly against him. With loud cries they rose from their seats and poured down toward the Egyptian. Lifting his eyes at this terrible moment, Rabaches beheld a strange and awful apparition. He beheld, and his craft restored his courage. He stretched his hand on high over his lofty brow and royal features that came an expression of unutterable solemnity and command. Behold! he shouted with a voice of thunder which stilled the voice, the roar of the crowd. Behold how the gods protect the guiltless. The fires of the avenging orcas burst forth against the false witness of my accusers. The eyes of the crowd followed the gesture of the Egyptian and beheld with an ineffable dismay a vast vapor shooting from the summit of Vesuvius in the form of a gigantic pine tree, the trunk blackness, the branches fire, a fire that shifted and wavered in its hues with every moment, now fiercely luminous, now of a dull and dying red, that again blazed terrifically forth with intolerable glare. The earth shook, the walls of the theatre trembled, in the distance was heard the crash of falling roofs. The clouds seemed to roll towards the assembly, casting forth from its bosom showers of ashes mixed with fragments of burning stone. Then the burning mountain cast up columns of boiling water. In the ghastly night thus rushing upon the realm of noon, all thought of justice and of our baches left the minds of these terrified people. There ensued a mad flight for the sea. Through the darkness, Nydia guided Glaucus, now partly recovered from the effects of the poison draught, and Ione, to the shore. Her blindness rendered the scene familiar to her alone. While our baches perished with the majority, these three eventually gained the sea and joined a group who, bolder than the rest, resolved to hazard any peril rather than continue on the stricken land. Utterly exhausted, Ione slept on the breast of Glaucus, and Nydia lay at his feet. Meanwhile, showers of dust and ashes fell into the waves, scattered their snows over the deck of the vessel they had boarded, and borne by the winds descended upon the remotest climes, startling even the sore of the African and the whirling along the antique soil of Syria and of Egypt. Meekly, softly, beautifully dawned at last the light over the trembling deep. The winds were sinking to rest. The foam died from the azure of that delicious sea. Under the east, thin mists caught gradually the rosy hues that heralded the morning. Light was about to resume her reign. There was no shout from the mariners at the dawning light. It had come too gradually, and they were too wearied for such sudden bursts of joy. Yet there was a low, deep murmur of thankfulness amidst those watchers of the long night. They looked at each other and smiled, and they took heart. In the silence of the general's sleep, Nydia had risen gently. Bending over the face of Glaucus, she softly kissed him. She felt for his hand, <laughs> the hand that was locked in that of Ione. Nydia sighed deeply, and her face darkened. Again Nydia kissed Glaucus's brow, and with her hair wiped from it the damps of the night. Oh, may the gods bless you, Athenian, she murmured. May you be happy with your beloved one. May you, may you sometimes remember, Nydia, alas. She is of no further use on this earth. With these words, Nydia turned away. A sailor, half dozing on the deck, heard a slight splash on the waters. 
Drowsily, he looked up, and behind, as the vessel bounded merrily on, he fancied he saw something white above the waves. But it vanished in an instant. He turned round again and dreamed of his home and children. When the lovers awoke, the first thought was each other. Their next thought was of Nydia. Every crevice of the vessel was searched. There was no trace of her. Mysterious from first to last, the blind Thessalian had vanished from the living world. They guessed her fate in silence. Glaucus and Ione, while they drew nearer to each other, feeling each other the, the world itself, they forgot their deliverance and wept as for a dear departed sister. And so that was the last days of Pompeii. I hope you've enjoyed this special live presentation by Storylink Radio. Please remember to hit the subscribe button and stop by our website at www.storylinkradio.com Thank you, everyone. <laughs>